that we pray. Amen. Well, again, we've come to the end of the sermon. And the multitudes are probably not shuffling in their seats, you know, putting their outlines away, looking for their songbooks, trying to figure out what the invitation song is going to be. Because they're just too enraptured by Jesus, right? They're trying to figure out what in the world is he going to say, right? I don't have the skill that Jesus had, right? People are, they know my sermon's ending, right? They know, okay, Brian, you know, I, he's coming to an end. I can put away my stuff and kind of zone out and figure out what he's going to say in the last five seconds. With Jesus, they don't know what's coming next because he's just hitting them with all kinds of crazy stuff at the end of this sermon, and it's very shocking, everything he's saying. And one of the things he does to really hold their attention, uh, especially at the end here, uh, is he, he calls them to action. Uh, a well-known preacher, uh, many of you may have heard of D. Bowman. Uh, he has trained many young preachers to preach. And he always says, a good sermon is one that storms the will. And that's what he does. He just, he just storms your will. He calls on you to act. He does not want anybody to walk away from this sermon thinking, oh, that was kind of like an interesting discourse. <laughs> that was an interesting theological discussion. You know, that was a... That was a fascinating FC lecture. You know, you got to get the CD, you know. Well, okay, yeah, it is fascinating, but that's not what Jesus wants people to think. He, he wants people to walk away completely changed in not just their understanding of God, but their willingness to actually do God's will. He wants them to obey, to go home and to do this stuff. And to put it in action, right? To be is a little corny, but, you know, to be Home Depot Christians, right? Where doers go to get things done. Okay, that's the kind of Christianity that Jesus wants these people uh, to adopt. And with that, uh, or in order to accomplish that, he, he does that with a contrast between two builders at the end of this lesson in verses 24 to 27. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. You know, as Floridians, this parable makes perfect sense because we have sand everywhere, okay? And it, it makes it very difficult for us to build houses here in Florida. Uh, and so we just hire concrete companies and they come and they got the little, you know, cement trucks with the rolling <laughs> trucks and they uh, lay those slabs for us. And then we can, you know, build on those foundations. But of course, they didn't have those trucks back then in Palestine. So in ancient Palestine, it was a lot harder. You had to dig super deep. Like we're talking like 10 feet deep into the soil to reach the layer of soil uh, known as the bedrock. And it was kind of deceiving, uh, especially around the Sea of Galilee, because the, the superficial sandy layers especially in the hot summer months, could become like super hardened. And so it could seem like that sandy layer was actually rock. But in reality, it was just sand that had become baked by the hot sun. And so you thought, okay, maybe it's fine to build a house here. But the problem is, as soon as the rainy season started, well, then that, well, that sand just started to get soft and then... You know, it would erode and just slip out from, from underneath you. Okay? If you wanted a really strong foundation, well, you'd, it, it'd just be hard work. You'd have, to, you'd have to really put in the effort to dig deep. And even though we have a kid's song about this, you know, and the kids really love to sing about how the, you know, the foolish man's house went splat and all that stuff, when you grow up and become an adult, you realize how horrifying this parable actually is. Because if you're you know, living in a house like along the Sea of Galilee, right? And you get the rainy season and the Jordan River's overflowing and the Sea of Galilee's overflowing and your house just like floats away in the middle of the night. You're talking about like 
your death and the death of your entire family. So this is actually quite horrifying. Jesus is saying, if you don't do what I say in this sermon, you will die a calamitous death. Maybe Dwayne and I should end our sermons more like that. I mean, maybe that will get more people to come forward while we stand and sing. Okay, it's a very powerful image here. And of course, he's not really talking about physically dying from a physical flood. Uh, A flood in Scripture is common language for a couple different things. One, a time of great trial uh, or, or crisis. Psalm 69, verse 2, just uh, for an example, David says, I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. <clears throat> Another common usage of this is an outpouring of God's wrath for sin. And of course, that kind of paradigm, well, that starts in Genesis 6, right, with the great world flood, but then that becomes like a design pattern that's repeated throughout Scripture, um, In Ezekiel 13, this is God talking about his judgment against false prophets. And he says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a violent wind break out in my wrath. There will also be in my anger a flooding rain and hailstones to consume it in wrath. And Nahum 1.8, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, just because of the way it is worded. uh, This is a judgment against Nineveh. He says, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Is that not the coolest verse like in the Bible? That is the cool. Pursue his enemies into darkness. That is that is awesome. Anyway, uh, ultimately, Jesus is saying, if we want to be able to stand firm in times of crisis and trial and ultimately to stand firm in the final day of judgment, Uh, as God pours out his wrath against sin, we have to build our house on the rock by taking action and putting these words in the Sermon on the Mount into action in our lives. Now, before I open up for comments, let's break this down a little bit further. It seems like the house he's talking about here is just the, the things that provide the basic structure of our life. It's It's everything that we as humans typically build for ourselves here, like our careers and school and families and friendships and hobbies and passions and possessions. I mean, everybody is building a life for themselves. And this this applies to Christians. This applies to non-Christians. Everybody is building a house here in, in this world. You can't really get around that, okay? All of us are doing this. The difference is in the foundation. And Jesus says the wise person builds their life on the rock of obedience to his words on the Sermon on the Mount. And I I think there's, we could maybe expand this a little bit uh, to encompass a little bit more detail about the rock, okay? I'll, I'll expand it this way. The rock is to be undergirded with a proper understanding of a a godly worldview in that I I understand my my origin, right? I understand my identity. I understand the meaning of life. I understand the, the proper moral framework by which to live. And I understand my ultimate destiny, where I'm headed uh, in, in life, because I have this godly worldview. I also have the proper lens through which to interpret crisis and trials and suffering and pain that I face in life as I am building my house and I am facing all of the the miniature floods and trials along the way. I also have a deep abiding trust and hope in God's promises and I understand salvation and my proper you know, relationship to God and, and His grace and where I stand because of my, my moral failings and the, the salvation and that gift on, on the cross. And yes, ultimately, where Jesus is heading here is, I, I'm an active doer. I put the Sermon on the Mount, these principles, loving God, loving my neighbor, I put these things into practice. That, that's kind of a more comprehensive picture of what it means to build my house 
on the rock. That's what a wise person is. So with that kind of understanding then, here's my question to you all. What are some other foundations that people spend their lives building on? Um, and do you have any examples from Scripture or from modern life? In other words, if you want to use this chart, what would be some sandy soil that people build their lives on, some foolish soil, rather than the rocky foundation of obedience to the words in the sermon? All right, Joe's got one, Terry's got one. And I understand maybe you feel like this question is too easy, so feel free to think outside the box if you want. Uh, I, I'd, I'd put down education or knowledge, and my example would be the Pharisees, because that's what this whole sermon has been built on. It's good to know that, but you need to go further. Okay, really good. Yeah, some people, they, they think, listen, the, the foundation of their life is their their earthly brilliance. How many letters can I add to the end of my name, right? Uh, how many degrees uh, can I get? Um, but I find it interesting that when Jesus talks about the wise man here, do you notice he doesn't say anything about IQ level? He says the truly wise person is the one who obeys <laughs> His word. Wisdom in Scripture is not a mental evaluation. It is a moral evaluation. Um, Paul warns in 2 Timothy 3, 7 about those who are always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is such a fascinating statement. What will it matter if you have the knowledge of all the world's books in your head on the day of judgment, but you never obeyed the Lord. The quadratic equation won't save us on the day of judgment. The knowledge of how to perform open heart surgery will not save us on the day of judgment. <laughs> the ability to play La Campanella on the piano will not save us on the day of judgment. I, I brought that up because apparently that's known as one of the hardest pieces in the world to play on the piano. doesn't matter. You can have knowledge about that. won't save you. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 and 13, Be warned, the writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. Terry? I think it's. Uh, I think this deals with uh, motivation. A lot of times, uh, we're motivated by uh, by security. We we want to we want to be like the uh, like the uh, rich farmer, the the wealthy landowner who had that that barn full of grain, and then he wanted to build a bigger barn to put more grain in it to be more secure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can't be our security. Is it wise to to lay up, you know, some savings or what have you, well, of course, but that can't be our all in all. Mm. We, we can't put our trust in that. Mm. And so I think that that's, I, I think that's the switch that has to be made in our mind. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, there's a proverb that says, um, well, wealth to a rich man is like a high wall in his imagination. Yes. And yeah, unfortunately, it is, it is just in his imagination. And it can just be removed at any moment and swept away. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, <clears throat> the fallacy of keeping up with uh, the Joneses, so to speak. What uh, your neighbors might have, well, bottom line, spiritually speaking, they need to keep up with us or what we can share mm -hmm. to the neighbors around us, not what we have in terms of the worldly things, but what we have. Sure, yeah, earthly status, yeah, possessions, keeping up with others around us. Yeah, all that stuff is so fleeting. Um, yeah, up here, Debbie's got one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when you when you watch. I, I just find it fascinating to watch documentaries about celebrities. You know, whether it's like uh, famous actors or singers or athletes, because there's like a 
there's just a common motif. It's like a story arc where you have the rise, right? And it's just, everything's just great, and everybody loves them, and their life is amazing. Everybody wants to be them, right? And they just are on top of the world. And then something happens. An album flops, right? Or, or as an athlete, they get injured, or maybe they just get older and, and something changes, their style changes, or they, they, they can't play the sport like they used to. And it's weird. It's like their fans just turn on them in an instant, right? And things just, there's like a turning point, and things are just n not the same for them anymore. And then you just have this, like, <laughs> just, just crash and burn, and, and they realize, there, there's like this moment where they realize, okay, I can't live for fame anymore. Like this thing that I was building my entire life on just totally slipped out from underneath me and, and abandoned me. And now, I, I, so one of, one of two things happens with them, either they totally just crash and burn and they just drug addict out and they just you know, commit suicide or they just you know, fall off the face of the earth and no one ever hears from them again. Or they reinvent themselves in some way and they realize, wow, I gotta, I gotta find something that's actually more meaningful here. <laughs> so I gotta find a better foundation upon which to build my life, right? And Maybe they don't find God, but, but they might find something that God actually tells them is more meaningful, you know, like serving others in some way, right? Uh, and so they, they do find something that's actually more fulfilling because they're doing something that, that God actually tells them is better for them. Uh, and those are actually the happier endings uh, to those stories. But you just see it all the time. Yeah, Debbie, sorry. Go ahead. Well, she said you oh, covered I stole, hers. Oh, man, I stole yours. So sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. But, but I was uh, I'm thinking about, there was a show years ago. We didn't watch it in our house, but it was uh, Miami Vice. Mm. And, uh, but I remember reading a story about one of the actors in there, uh, you know, bought a, you know, expensive houses and cars and parties and all, and then the show got canceled. Mm. And all that debt, and now he's bankrupt, you know. Mm. And it's, it's building and having confidence in something that can be very temporary, you know, the treasure, store up treasures in heaven, that makes us, gives us a false sense of security, and we forget that things don't stay the same forever, except God, and that's what we need to invest in. Yeah. So it's just so sad that people put everything into something that's just, shiny and glimmering and ephemeral. Yeah, yeah, and I love, that's, that's, what's so, that's why Jesus is so brilliant. I mean, the sand analogy is just so brilliant because the sand and the rain, right? I mean, that, that's what happens. The rain comes, mixes with the sand, and then it just, it washes it away, right? But when the sand, when the rain comes on the rock, the rock doesn't move. The, rock, the, the rain just bounces off the rock doesn't do a thing to it. And that's why over and over again, God in Scripture is referred to as a rock. Right? He is our rock. He is our refuge because he is unchanging, though the entire world around us is always changing. God is unchanging. He is our solid rock that we can trust, we can count on, we can always build upon him, whereas everything else is a shifting sand. Right? I mean, any other sandy uh, foundations that you have? Um, I have more I can share, but I just giving you time, extra time. <clears throat> Good health is another one. I mean, people are just, especially in our in our well, I don't know, I don't want to say that because obviously there are people in our culture that don't care about their health at all. <laughs> so everybody's different, right? But there there is a movement in our culture that's just of people who are absolutely obsessed with health is just, it's almost like a refusal to believe that we're dying, right? That almost this illusion of thinking we can reverse death. <laughs> and if we could just have enough protein shakes, right? <laughs> or we can spend enough hours in the gym, 
then we can ignore the reality that we are mortal. And that's just not, that's not true uh, because it, all of our efforts at health, it, it's good to take care of our bodies. Okay, that, that's a good thing. Sometimes Christians, unfortunately, go the opposite extreme and don't care enough about our bodies at all. Um, good to take care of our health. But even if you take care of your health, there are still so many things beyond our control. You can do as much as you can to take care of your health, but you'd be the healthiest person in the world, but still get some disease because it's, it's genetic. Right? You could still get something because it's just in your family and there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's very sad. Um, or even, at, let's just say, you are the healthiest person in the world. You never get a single illness your entire life, nothing terminal, no cancer, nothing. And then you stand before God on the day of judgment and you never obeyed him. What did any of it matter? Now what are you going to do for all eternity? You were super healthy for 80 years or whatever. Maybe you lived to 100 years because you were super healthy. Okay, what are you going to do for eternity now? What good did your health do for you for all eternity now? No good. Did you absolutely nothing? One of my mentors, one of the most favorite people in the world, Marty Pickup. Many of you knew him well. While he was not a marathon runner, uh, he did try to keep in shape, and he was actually playing tennis when he died. Had a heart attack right on the court, and I believe right around the age of 55. Gratefully, he was one of the wise builders who was building his house on the rock because he certainly couldn't put his trust in tennis. Or fitness. First Timothy 4.8 says, Bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So the point is not to neglect one. You know, don't neglect your physical health. That's not the point. But certainly don't trade it in for your soul. Any other sandy foundations? <clears throat> All right, I'll throw one more in for fun. People pleasing. There are so many in the world who build their entire life on avoiding conflict and making sure other people think well of them. But the problem is their whole life basically becomes one big lie because they feel they have to hide their real thoughts and feelings for fear of rejection. So they lose themselves in a web of dishonesty and all the masks they have to wear for the different people in their lives. And it's exhausting having to be fake all the time. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And of course, later in that letter, Peter, uh, he tries to please men. He tries to please the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem by pretending like he's not friends with the Gentile Christians. Uh, really, really shallow, but this is, this is a sandy foundation. I have to make sure everybody likes me. And it's sandy because that's impossible. There's, you're always going to have people that don't like you. <laughs> you, can't, <laughs> you, you just can't do it, right? Uh, and... And the only people who like you are people who don't even know you because they've only, they're only liking a false version of you. So even that's fake and sandy. All right. Here's another question, and uh, maybe this is a hard one. Uh, oh, did I see another? Is there another hand up? Oh, Will's canceling. Okay, no problem. All right, uh, here's another question. How can times of crisis give us glimpses into the kind of foundation we're building on? Do you have any examples from scripture uh, or, or modern life? Um, I was realizing this might be kind of a hard question, maybe too related to the first one, I'm not sure. Um, I'll say some things <laughs> to give you time to 
more time to think about it maybe. Um, let me say this. I believe God in his grace sends us little floods along the way in life to give us glimpses of the faulty, sandy foundations that we've been building on along the way so that we don't have to face that truth on the final day of judgment in the end when it's too late to change. Yeah, I think he wants us to see sooner than the final day of judgment that we've been building on the wrong foundation so that we have an opportunity to change okay, and start building on the right foundation. Um, and that's not, that's not a pleasant experience okay, because sometimes the damage from these little floods along the way, these these smaller crises and trials that we go through along the way, sometimes that damage might be really severe. We might lose our house. We might lose our possession. We might lose loved ones. We might really suffer severe damage, but God still leaves us alive, right? <laughs> Enough to realize, wow, my foundation was just all wrong. I was not building on the rock at all. My foundation was just complete sand. And now I need, to, I need to rebuild on the rock this time and start, and start building on God. My question is, how does that, how does that happen? How, how do those times of crisis expose the sandy foundations that we've been building on? Joe. Uh, I guess pick a variety of calamity. Uh, uh, you lose your job. Do you say, why did God do that to me? He knows I'm in debt. He knows I can't make the mortgage. Or is it the case, well, maybe I can find another job where I can be more like Christ, and this has been hampering me. So it's, it's, it's how you think about a given calamity that begins to define where your heart is and where your mind is, mind is when, when those troubles come along. Okay, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, sometimes the... the God will use a crisis to expose where our heart was, where, where our trust really was. Uh, and our trust wasn't really in God. It was in the thing that we lost. Yeah, Will? What I intend on saying is very similar, but it's, it's going to be in a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So obviously, as he said, um, we... <laughs> how we respond to the situation is based on our heart. Um, I would say, in addition, um, just if you're feeling any particular way about any crisis, big or small, let yourself feel it, but make sure you don't linger in those feelings because that's just unproductive, whether you're, uh, yeah, just unproductive. Okay, all right, yeah, Bobby. Um, <clears throat> when I used to give tours downtown, way back when, I used to always uh, be fascinated with buildings that we used to have. Uh, these are century-old buildings, and you know they survived every hurricane. Something that I was thinking about recently, especially with the question, was, you know, what kind of saves a lot of these historical buildings is they're always put on a firm foundation. But the foundation helps because the building has to be flexible itself. That's what saves a lot of these buildings is the ability to be flexible on the foundation, it doesn't rip apart. Versus on a weaker foundation, it will rip apart. So by saying that and translating that over to Christ, whenever these crises come, we can be flexible like the Apostle Paul states that I can be comfortable poor, I can be comfortable rich. And that's because of Christ, the foundation, versus these other foundations that as soon as a crisis comes, our whole life gets ripped apart. Mm -hmm. So Christ allows us to be flexible like Paul states. Yeah, okay. Yeah, really good. So, yeah, the crisis can reveal, like our reaction to the crisis, you know, reveals a lot about our, about our foundation. Yeah. Debbie's got one. Uh, I was just thinking about <clears throat> biblical examples, and the first one I thought about was Job. Okay. You yeah. know, he, I mean, he... <laughs> Talk about calamity. He lost everything in one day. Mm. And yet he, he took the time to work through it, mm -hmm. even though his friends weren't very helpful, but he did work through it. And then another one I thought about was just David. David was faced with calamity time after time after time. And 
you know, he's like, I'm not going to do the wrong thing. I'm going to keep doing what's right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, our foundation is what gives us the correct lens to see these problems from. Mm -hmm. You know, is this, is this something that I, will help me to stick with my beliefs? Or is this something that's going to cause my beliefs to wash out from under me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that, and that was one of the things I, I had. It's like uh, my foundation in a, in a time of crisis may offer me no comfort or hope, right? If I have the wrong foundation, it will be exposed in time of crisis that yeah, this foundation is just gives me nothing <laughs> in, in, this, in this situation. Uh, I mean, a yeah, bunch of different examples. Let, let's say... Let's say my foundation is a health and wealth gospel, where I just think, you know, God, if I'm faithful, well, then he's just going to give me all kinds of money and prosperity and good health, and everything's going to go great for me. Well, then when I'm in a time of crisis, that foundation is going to tell me uh, either, number one, I must be, God must be angry at me, because I must just be a horrible sinner, and he's punishing me, uh, or God is just unfair. So now in this crisis, my foundation is either going to fill me with <laughs> unjustified guilt or unjustified resentment against God. And now my foundation really offers me no hope or comfort at all because it's, it's, like you said, it's an improper lens through which to interpret this, this crisis. Okay, so that's, that's not helpful. Uh, or alternatively, if my foundation for life is pleasure, and my, my whole philosophy is do what feels good. But then I have a, an illness that strikes me with chronic pain. And so it's literally impossible for me to ever feel good. Well, what, how does my foundation help me, <laughs> offer me any hope at all in that situation? I can't feel good. So how, how can that be my foundation now for life? <clears throat> nothing. There's nothing there. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, another thing I had is that my, my foundation may offer no answers to even explain the crisis. There's, there may be no explanatory power in my foundation. Uh, and that's one of the beauties of Christianity. Christianity offers the most robust explanation for suffering and pain in this world than any other religious view, than any other you know, foundation uh, for life. Um, it's been, oh, Carrie Ann, I didn't see you. Go ahead. No, the, the first thing that I thought of with this question was um, about prayer. For one, when things go wrong, do you think to pray or are you quick to just run to others, um, which can be difficult? Um, and also, then if you are praying, then what is your prayer? Is it for God to just remove the hardship, which is not necessarily a bad thing to do, but um, could it be that, or is it, God, whatever you want in this situation, that's what we're going to do, and mm -hmm. help me to be okay with that? Mm -hmm. um, recently, I went through a tough time, and I remember praying to God, telling him that I will praise you no matter what happens, and that was really hard to say um, and hard to really mean, but I think that if we can get there, that really shows where our foundation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, and... Yeah, it just the, there's nothing like a crisis to expose where we're really building. It's easy to say, "Oh, I'm building on the rock," you know, when everything's going well. And then when the rains come, that's what really exposes if it's sand or rock or not. And that's part of the parable too, is that everybody's house, everybody looks the same. You can't see the foundation of anybody until the rains come. It's the rain that exposes the true foundation. Um, yeah, Christianity, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about the explanatory power, everybody says, well, you know, if God really loved us, you know, he, he'd take away all suffering. It's like he did. He cre First of all, he created a world where there was no suffering. And he does exactly what he did. But then we ruined that. We brought suffering on ourselves because of our sin. And so... What God did then was he said, okay, I'm going to then use that suffering that you guys brought upon yourselves, 
as a way to shape your character, to draw you closer to me, to uh, make you more like my son, then not only that, I'm going to show you how much I love you and empathize with your suffering by sending my son into the world to experience all of the suffering that you experience, to take all of the suffering and pain that the earth has to offer onto himself on the cross. Not only so you know that I can empathize with you as you suffer, but so that I can then take you to a place where there is no suffering anymore and remove all pain and all tears. Once again, restoring you to the original design that I had, which was to live with me in eternal bliss where there is no pain and suffering. So Christianity has like literally the, the most robust picture uh, that there is. But if you want to build your life on a sandy foundation like atheism and you go through a crisis of suffering, you have no answer for it. All you have is this is random and it's meaningless because, I mean, you can try to assign meaning to it. You can say, well, you know, maybe the universe is trying to teach me something. Okay, but the universe is not personal. The universe is not teaching you. The universe can't teach you anything because it's not personal. Uh, you're trying to anthropomorphize, right, the universe. You're trying to make the universe into God, right? That, that's impossible. The universe is not personal, okay? Uh, it's meaningless. It's random. You have no answer for the crisis, okay? So... Really, really amazing what a crisis can do to expose the foundations of our life. Okay, um, let me let me just make this point. The main point here of this section is don't just hear the sermon, go and do it. This is what James says. This is Jesus' brother later. He says, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer... He's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. It's like you go into the mirror, you see all your hairs are you know, out of place, and you know you got food stuck in your teeth, and then you go back out in society and you don't make any changes, you don't do anything about it. Like that's really weird. We wouldn't do that, right? But that's what Jesus has done with the Sermon on the Mount. He has held up a mirror to us and said, here's who you are before God. Here's all the issues that you have. I'm exposing who you really are. And we're like, ah, these are all the things I need to change. And then we just go back out in society and like, don't do anything about it. That would be equally weird and dumb. And Jesus is saying, don't do that, okay? Make the changes. Be doers. Walk away making these changes, putting this sermon into practice in your life. And then finally, these last two verses in Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as, the, as their scribes. So when the scribes taught, they would always make appeals to other sources of authority. So they would teach, and then they would say, at the end of their talks, they would say, as Rabbi so-and-so says, and then it would be like a, a stamp of authority on their talk. And so people might doubt what they were saying, but then when they said, as Rabbi so-and-so said, well, they said, oh, well, okay, well, then we'll, then we'll believe you. But Jesus didn't do that. He just said, I say to you. And then that was it. <laughs> it was like, he's the final authority. He spoke as if he was it. He spoke as if he was God, because he was. And so my final question, what are the implications for our lives and our relationship with Jesus, knowing that he taught as one having authority and not as their scribes. <clears throat> All right, Dave's got one. And I'll just piggyback off of, uh, off of Tim. Well, well, go ahead, I don't wanna take Dave's. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure mine is not as well thought through uh, as yours. Go ahead. Um, it's interesting that we begin and end the talk about the parables with the crowd. Uh, and four, the crowds had come from all over the place, the Catholics, the Galileans, the Jordan, beyond the Jordan. And they had come for the most shallow of reasons. And that was the time. Some kind of relief in their own lives, you know, in this earthly existence. And Jesus was trying to teach them to be more concerned about what I offer eternally. And so he gave them, in these three chapters, 
what is probably the most difficult and challenging teaching, teaching ever given. And now at the conclusion of it, he's challenging them, well, what are you going to do with this? And, you know, both houses face the storms. And I think of the parable of the sowers is what it reminds me of. But both houses face the storm. And for this crowd that is listening to this, you're going to face the same storms. It depends on what, whether you're going to listen to what I've said for these last three chapters or not. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a challenge there, you know, to, to build your house. Yeah. And time is going to tell whether or not you've built your house on what I'm teaching you or, you know, and back to the verses we talked about last week, because it begins the section before. Yeah. You know, don't self-deceive and, and think you're going to get money. Life is going to challenge you. It's going to reveal what you are built on. Yeah. So listen to me. Yeah. Amen. Um, yeah, a couple things. He's our king, not just our buddy. Um, it is true he calls himself our friend later, um, but he also says, you're my friend if you do what I command you. How many friends say that to you? That's, that'd be weird, right, if your friend said that to you. <laughs> That's a different kind of friendship, okay? Uh, sometimes we emphasize the human nature of Jesus so much, we forget the divine. Uh, and I'll piggyback on what Tim said this morning. This is especially true around Christmas because people like to think of Jesus as a cute, cuddly baby because, you know, the, the cute, cuddly baby is much easier to deal with than the adult baby who tells you what to do, okay? <laughs> Uh, but he speaks with authority. He gives us commands. We have to do what he says. Also, he's our pilot, not our co-pilot. Uh, many times we like to fly our own life and just kind of double check with Jesus, make sure he's okay with all the decisions we've made. Um, and then finally, we can trust that his way is right. We even use the terminology today when we say he's the, he's the an authority on the subject. Right? Jesus knows what he's talking about. And Satan convinces us that he doesn't and his way is better. But... We can trust Jesus' way is right. He knows what he's saying, even when it's, it seems counterintuitive uh, at times. Um, I saw you, Scott, but we just ran out of time. I was just going to say, we should know who has the final say. Yeah, we should know who has the final say. Amen. Our last question was this. Do you have any lingering questions or concerns about the Sermon on the Mount? If not, if you do, too bad, because uh, we were out of time. Uh, but we also have a Q&A box, so you can put that in the back, and Dwayne will answer all your concerns. So. <laughs>